I guess it's my turn. <laughs> um, just if y'all could open your Bibles to First Peter, we'll start in there in chapter two. And while y'all are turning, again, I'd just like to say thank you just um, to Pastor Jason just for being able to give me this opportunity to come preach um, my first message. Um, thank you for all the people that have prayed for me. I know many people have come to me, all the encouragement. I mean, I'm very grateful for it, and I don't know what I'd do without it. Um, but I'm just very thankful for you. And so I hear Paige is still turning, so I'll try to take my time. But we'll be in First Peter, starting off in chapter 2, verse 9. If you're there, say amen. amen. In verse 9 it says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now, looking at this verse, I mean, as I was praying about, God, what would you have me to preach? Um, and this verse just, it came to me one day, and I saw it, and I thought, and I thought well, that's, that's a good verse, and I like what those words say, and God, I understand that you're trying to call me to preach that. So, as I was looking at this verse, I was reading through it, and this is a verse that a lot of people know growing up in Christian school. I mean, we, we memorize this verse a lot. We know this verse. I mean, we memorize it almost every single year. It's on the list. I mean, it's just, an, it's just a good verse, something that a lot of people know, very familiar. And just from context from this verse, in First Peter, Peter is writing to believers who are persecuted, and they're being tried for their faith. They're not on the easy way right now. They're, they're in the tough spot, is what I mean. He's reminding them of these terms that were used in the Old Testament for the children of Israel. A chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people. And as I look at these terms, the one that just keeps coming out to me that I like to look at is this last one, a peculiar people. The next, I look at this word peculiar, I think a lot of different things. I think the word means different, weird, unusual, out of the norm, uh, out of the status quo kind of. And you think a lot of people when they hear that word peculiar, they think, oh, that's a bad thing. That's not something you want to be. You don't want to be peculiar. That's something different. But I like to encourage you that to be a peculiar person, that's going to be a good thing. That's something you want to be. Amen. The dictionary defines the word peculiar as odd or unusual, unique. Growing up as a young person, I see this phrase all the time anywhere I go. A lot of time in ads, they'll say, show your true colors, be you, be different. But that's not really what Peter was talking about when he was telling them a peculiar people. He was talking about to be a peculiar people in Christ to be separated from the wickedness and the darkness that surrounded them at the time, to be unique in the eyes of God. Now I can testify that there are many Christians today that call themselves Christians, yet they're not a peculiar people. They try to, they try to, they try to live this life with the world and being a Christian. And I can tell you that that's not going to work out for you. If you want to be a true Christian, you're going to have to be a peculiar person. It's one, one thing that Brother Michael's going through right now, a series that I really like. It's called Dare to Be a Christian. And he's gone through it so far. He's talking about David. And I love the story of David. It's a great story. But I can say that David was a peculiar person. No matter through his highs, through his lows, he was a peculiar person. People saw it. So tonight I just want to encourage you to be a peculiar person and that we need to be God's peculiar people. And so if you title this message, it would be, How to Be God's Peculiar People. Amen. Starting off, the first point I want to say is to be peculiar and accepting. If you want to be God's peculiar people, be peculiar and accepting. If we look in verse 10 of chapter 2, it says, Which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. This, this step of being peculiar and accepting, 
I would say is the first and the most important step to being a peculiar person. You have to accept that Jesus Christ came to earth from heaven, was born of a virgin, lived a perfect life, but died on a cross paying the ultimate sacrifice for our sins with his blood, and in his power rose three days later from the grave and later ascended to heaven to sit at the right hand of God. And all this just so we could be able to live forever in the perfect paradise called heaven. Amen. You can be peculiar, like this verse says, by accepting the mercy that God has given us. You cannot be a different person if you have not accepted Christ as your Savior. It's just simply impossible to be a peculiar person if you don't know Jesus as your Savior. You can go to church, you can put on a face, and you can walk right out, but you've done nothing if you haven't sincerely accepted God's gift of mercy and asked Him for, to forgive you of your sins. Amen. There will ultimately be no change in your heart, and you will be headed for hell if you haven't accepted, if you haven't accepted Christ. Right. But like I said, the first step is accepting. Romans 10.9 says that if thou shalt confess with, the, with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Amen. Now I know this is the Sunday night crowd. A lot of people that come here, I'm not, I'm not going to go by without saying that there could be somebody in here that may not be saved. Right. And I don't want to go past this point just flying by through, right. thinking, oh, this is the Sunday night crowd. Everyone's saved. Everyone comes to church. They want to be here. But I know that's simply not the case. So... To those people who may not be saved, I like to say that if that is you, you can be different and you can be peculiar. And you can live a perfect life. So wrapping up number one, be peculiar and accepting the gift of God. Number two, be peculiar in attitude. If we could just flip a page real quick, I'd like to go to 1 Peter 4. And I'd like to read verses 1 through 4. For as much, then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. The time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. If you didn't catch all that, I know I just flew by it a little quick, but just to summarize, the verses are simply saying that if you have the same mindset, same attitude as Christ, that you will live for God's will and not for men's. Verse 3 and 4 go on to say that in the past you would have done these sins, you would have done these wrong things, but now you're different, you're peculiar, you've changed. And these old friends, these old so-called friends that you ha used to hang out with, they see the difference. They don't like it. They, want, they don't like that difference. They'll speak bad about you, and they know that you're different. And that, what a great thing it is to say that even when we're saved, sinners can see the difference. They know that, oh, something's different about them. When's the last time somebody came to you and they said, Oh, something's different about them. And I'm not trying to boast, but I know that people have come to me and said that, and I've been humbled by it. I mean, it's a humbling experience for someone to say to you, you're different from other people. And I'd like to say, when's the last time people said that about you? Amen. But as I'm speaking of be peculiar in attitude, I can say also that I have not had the best of attitudes sometimes. Mom and Dad could probably admit to that. As a kid, I really did struggle with an attitude as a kid, and sometimes I still struggle with that. But as I got saved, going back to that first point, Jesus made a change in my life. Those, that attitude that I had of hatefulness, sadness, it turned into love and joy. So I'd like to ask y'all, what's your attitude? How have you treated people? What do people say about your spirit? Are you living with the fruit of the Spirit, or do, you let the or do you let the lust of the flesh guide your way? 
If you're going to be a peculiar person, you must let your attitude be a reflection of God. Amen. You can have a peculiar attitude, just like these verses said, by remembering that Jesus suffered for you. He took on the weight that we couldn't bear. He paid the, ulti he paid the ultimate sacrifice for sin. We can never repay him for that. But in thankfulness, with our attitude, we can die to self every day, as Paul said, and live with a peculiar attitude from the world for him. We don't have to live a life of hate, but we can live a life of joy if we change our attitude and be peculiar from the world. Going on to point number three. Be peculiar in action. We've gone through acceptance, attitude, those are big two steps, one of the top twos. If you don't accept Christ, then it's not doing anything for you. You're not going to be a good Christian because you won't be a Christian. And then once you have the attitude down, that's a great step also because now you're starting to think, oh, what would Jesus do? You're starting to think these things. But now, moving to point number three, be peculiar in action. So... As I say in action, as I said, these two steps are down. You're saved, you have a mindset to serve God, but you just haven't moved to your mindset yet. You haven't done the action yet. God's told you, you've had them thoughts, you've had the attitude of it, but you just haven't walked on it. You've talked the talk, but you haven't started walking your talk and acting on what God has given you. Once you start acting on it, then you'll become a peculiar person from other people. You can't be afraid or you will continue to live just like the world. If you're not going to act on what God's called you to do, then go ahead and stop right now. That's what I did about six years ago. God started calling me and I just did not act on it. There was something that I said, well, God, that's not it or that's, that can't be it. But guess what? I just didn't act on it. But thankfully, I kept the good attitude, and God kept pressing me, and I'm able to be here today. You can't be afraid. You'll continue to live a life just like the world. You must be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and stand up to the king. Stand up to the kings of this world. Even if you have to be thrown into the flame, because guess what? Once you're in the flame, there will be a fourth man there. God will be there to protect you. You have to take a step towards God in your actions. Stop sitting back and watching everyone else do the work and being lazy. I'm sorry, but stop. <laughs> Show the world, or put in the effort and acts towards what God has called you to do. Don't be afraid. Show the world that you are one of God's peculiar people and what your actions tell about you. Lastly, I'd like to just say that if you live this peculiar life, if you take these three steps of acceptance, attitude, and action, and you live this life of a peculiar life, then like I read in 1 Peter 4, 4, where it says at the end of it, wherein they think it's strange that you run not with them to the same excess of right, speaking evil of you. People aren't going to like it. They're not going to like what you're saying if you're different. They're going to think you're weird, which, according to the eyes of the world, it's not a bad thing to be weird in God's sight. You want to be a peculiar person. You want to be different. You want to be this different person. But there will be naysayers. People will talk behind your back, and they'll talk bad about you. But let me encourage you. That if you're a peculiar person for God, then you are on the winning side. Amen. You've already won the victory. People can say all they want on this earth, but when it comes to heaven and when you're at the throne room of God, he'll be saying to you, well done, my good and faithful servant. But to the other people, he'll be saying, I never knew you. What a shameful thing. So I, I'd like to say, through this acceptance, through this attitude, do this action. Be a peculiar person. Share God's word with others. Don't be afraid to stand out for what you believe in. Be separated from the world. Don't compromise. Don't settle for it. Because once you're a peculiar person,
then you'll have God's blessing in your life. So just ending off, I dare you to be one of God's peculiar people. Thank you. She plays for a moment. We'll have a time of invitation. Scripture says it's better not to make a vow than to make a vow and not to keep it. And sometimes we all have good intentions. And we said it often, and I think he said it very clearly when he was speaking about salvation. There's a lot of people that come to church and they have good intentions. They, if you were to ask them, they want to go to heaven. I personally don't know anybody that's ever said, I want to go to hell. I don't. But just because you got good intentions, it does not make you saved. I want to say this, that just as he was preaching tonight about being a peculiar person, I think the same principle goes for that as well. Just because you have good intentions to be set apart and to be different, that don't mean that you're different. It's very plain. It takes a choice. It's a commitment. Matter of fact, I'd go as far to be able to say this. It's a death, a death to yourself. To say, Lord, I don't want to be like me. I don't want to be like others. Lord, I want to be what you want me to be. And, and that's not just by being a preacher or by being a, a Christian of any sort. No, I mean, that goes as far as even in your day-to-day walk. For you to be the husband that God wants you to be, you've got to die to yourself and say, Lord, you tell me what I need to do. You tell me how to position myself so that my wife can see you through me or my children can be reached and I think Brother Michael said it best when he was speaking about Noah and then Brother Shane and Miss Angie that, you know, it's, it is in a home. Well, that don't happen because you're just a wise person. You have to seek the Lord, and the Lord has to lead us on how to, to lead those who are coming behind us. So tonight, I think it's fitting to do two things. Number one, to stop for a second and be able to ask yourself, or maybe not even ask yourself. Talk to the Lord. Say, Lord, I just want to just want to know that I'm saved. Just be reminded. You say, well, I know I am. Just be reminded that you've done what the Scripture says, what He said, that you know that you confess the Lord Jesus Christ as a personal Savior, uh, that you've repented of your sins, and that you truly have accepted Him, and you know that. And tonight, if you have not done that, listen, as simple as it sounds, as honestly as, as simple as it is, you really must repent And believe in the Lord Jesus and accept him. And you can be born again, but that's the only way. But then it goes a step further. Maybe tonight you're here and just like me, I'll be honest, it might be his first message. But the word of God's powerful. It's not the man. He's just the vessel. I thank God for his obedience. But as he was preaching, thinking about those words about being set apart, being different, being able to live in such a way that people... They see your attitude. They see your actions. And I think here's a good question. Would somebody really want to come to church with you that knows you? And if so, who's the last person you brought? I mean, that's, boy, that's convicting to me. And I know it's, again, Sunday night and oh, we just come to church. But listen, these church pews could be full tonight if we'd realize that we're not here to reach the save. We're here to reach the lost. And the way to do that is to be set apart. People look at you and say, well, I don't know what they got, but I want the joy they have. I I want the testimony. I want that stability they have. And they say, well, what is it, Noah? What's so different about you? Or they call you by name. And the answer is simple. It's not me. It's the Lord. He's changed me. He's put me on a new path. Changed my eternity. Only God can give the peace that we have in our heart. So tonight as we have this moment of invitation, maybe those two questions will come to your mind. You'd be challenged on the Lord maybe tonight helping you to commit to die to yourself and say, Lord, help me to be able to live for you and be able to live in a way that gives you honor and glory. Wasn't that a good message? Stand to your feet, heads bowed, eyes closed. It is a joy and a privilege to be able to know that you've tuned in. And I pray that today that the word of God that was shared will be a blessing to you. If somehow, some way that the Lord has spoke to your heart, and maybe you're uh, sitting where you are and you don't know for sure that you're saved by the grace of God, and you've ever trusted Jesus Christ as a personal Savior, 
And I want you to know that the Word of God says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible makes it very plain, for the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You say, how do I get saved? You have to trust in Christ and Christ alone. Repent of your sin and then know as the Bible says where Jesus says, I am the way. And I pray that today that that will be your desire to be able to seek out for the Lord Jesus Christ, to be able to trust him as a Lord and Savior. If you do that today, and you repent of your sins and you take him as your Savior, would you do us a favor and contact our church office at 336-788-0551? We would love to be able to speak with you. We would love to be able to encourage you, maybe be able to help you find a local church no matter where you are today, and maybe even possibly disciple you. So we want to say thank you so much, and we are definitely going to be praying for you and this ministry that our church has. If you know you're saved and maybe the Lord spoke to you in a different way and there's something heavy on your heart, again, that same number, if you can contact us, we'll be so thankful to be able to reach out and be able to speak with you. But again, on behalf of the church and myself, thank you so much and may God bless you.